Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome to the final talk of our philosophy colloquium this semester. We are here to celebrate the life and work of Joe Lawrence. Uh, Heidegger famously, in one of his Aristotle seminars, introduced Aristotle biographically by saying, he was born, he lived, and he died. Uh, I don't think we can yet give Joe those honors, thank goodness. Uh, I personally could sing his praises, but I think he really does want to retire sometime soon, and doing so would really hold him up. So I will just mention the following things. Uh, he received his PhD from Tübingen. He taught at the University of Dallas before coming here, and to my calculations, he has been here for 32 years. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. 32 years. Wow. Uh, his publications include the following two or three last one forthcoming books, uh, Schelling's Philosophy of Eternal Beginning, Socrates Among Strangers, and the forthcoming translation of Schelling's 1811 Ages of the World. Uh, he's, he's going to speak to us today about uh, teaching ethics, and the question I think that is motivating him, he's always wondered how it is that Jesus and Socrates, those eminent teachers of humility, uh, were punished for arrogance. So without any further ado, please join me in giving a, a warm and eschatological welcome to Professor Joseph Lawrence. Okay, I have to give some kind of an account uh, for why I'm going to talk about ethics, given the fact that over the years, I've taught all kinds of courses in uh, the philosophy department, but I, I, I never taught ethics. Yeah. And uh, so it's, you know, it's, it, it's kind of like I you know, feel that it's important uh, for me to, well, finally say a word about ethics. And uh, uh, this is the way it came about. I was uh, in conversation uh, with Amit. Uh, probably about uh, two months ago, and uh, we, were, we were talking about, uh, well, the academy, what else? And uh, I complained about the fact that we always justify our research project on the basis of the good things that could potentially be done with our work. Right? And uh, so uh, I am in a biology class, and we're learning some kind of very esoteric technique about uh, how to uh, re-engineer viruses uh, so that they can eat away cancer cells. You know, And we hear that and respond, oh my gosh, that sounds really, really good. You know? and, uh, and we don't pause to reflect that the same technique we're learning could also be used to re-engineer uh, viruses that cause flu, making the flu much, much more contagious yeah, and uh, much, much more lethal. Yeah, and uh, what we fail to reflect on all too often uh, is the fact that knowledge doesn't just translate into power, you know, but uh, power corrupts. That is to say, uh, what we are engaged in in the modern academy is a pretty dangerous game. Right? And, uh, you know, we we only need to reflect a little bit about where we are in history uh, to, to be reminded of that. Um, and so I don't want to talk about things uh, too dire. I do want to suggest, though, that knowledge is clearly not in any simple and obvious way good. Uh, bound to a principle that is very much uh, in us and actually in each one of us, the principle of evil, you know, uh, knowledge is 
terrifying, right? Uh, we have the potential to uh, destroy the world any number of times. Yeah, we got that uh, by embarking upon the general research project that all of us in a college or university are still committed to. Yeah, and uh, so that's the problem. Yeah, and uh, it has a lot of different dimensions. Maybe I can um, unfold some of them. Um, I want to begin now by quoting something from Wendell Berry. He's a fellow Kentuckian, uh, someone whose farm is not so far from the farm that I grew up on, and someone that I've met with and talked with on multiple occasions and would even like to count as a friend. It seems we do share very much the same worldview. And above all, the same worry about what he calls the preponderance of the supposition in a time of great technological power that humans either know enough already or can learn enough soon enough to foresee and forestall any bad consequences of their use of that power. And with that, he quotes the strikingly naive and primitive superstition of Richard Dawkins, that our brains are big enough to see into the future and plot long-term consequences. An enduring article of faith in the scientific community, despite having been repeatedly disproved. Yes, the sudden twists and turns of time are jarring and can easily fill us with fear. But the idea that time is so securely bound by the law of cause and effect that the future lies fully contained in the past and the present, and that time itself is thereby an illusion, is itself a bit of ideological hogwash, a simple spin-off of what Immanuel Kant laid bare as one of the antinomies of reason. But enough of that. Instead of unfolding a philosophical argument, let me now simply quote some lines from T.S. Eliot's East Corker, lines that should be posted on the gates of every academy as a warning against primitive superstition and arrogant ignorance. Knowledge, Eliot writes, imposes a pattern and falsifies for the pattern is new in every moment. And every moment is a new and shocking valuation of all we have been. It's for that reason that he then goes on to say, the only wisdom we can hope to acquire is the wisdom of humility. Humility is endless. The houses are all gone under the sea. The dancers are all gone under the hill. And in the face of that simple truth, his conclusion, a conclusion that I would like to suggest should be our conclusion. In order for you to arrive at what you do not know, you must go by a way that is the way of ignorance. So that's from East Carker. Or to bind this with a word of scripture, often heard, but with a meaning that has been generally effaced in the contemporary academy. Blessed art the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Only the way of ignorance will lead us to the good that we do not know, what I can only liken to the hope 
beyond hope. I think with that, I can probably hazard uh, an answer to the question that Jeff quite rightly said is the question I've always been wrestling with. You know, uh, why is it that those two great teachers of humility, Socrates and Christ, were both executed you know, for the crime of arrogance? I mean, I think you can see the situation in these terms. If an institution binds itself you know, to the idea that secure knowledge is available to us and can get us to where we need to go, then to say a word, an honest word, on behalf of humility you know, is to violate one of the fundamental things that we think constitutes humility, you know, which is the willingness to simply go along with others and to embrace the common cause of the community, of the institution. It is, in a sense, an act of arrogance to say, well, wait a minute. I, I don't think you guys know quite as much as you're pretending that you know. No, I, 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 I want to say out loud, right? I want to say out loud that uh, we don't really know anything of what's truly important. And what's truly important is knowing who we are and where it is that we individually and collectively should be headed. You know, the problem then, as I was discussing this with Amit, is that his response to my little presentation. Well, uh, look, the biology teacher says we can re-engineer the viruses and consequently cure cancer. Now, I imagine a clever student saying, but wait a minute, professor. We can use that very technology you know, uh, in order to uh, destroy humanity. Now, what assurance can you give me, Professor, that given the fact that human beings have always been capable of great violence, great aggression, not only to one another, but ultimately to themselves. Now, given that, what assurance can you give me that this knowledge which certainly could be used for good purposes, won't be used for bad purposes. Now, and then Ahmed made the very good suggestion, well, we need to teach more ethics. And thus my title, Teaching Ethics. Since I'm not an expert in ethics, I'll, uh, in order to prepare myself for a little talk, I uh, went to the library and got some anthologies you know, of articles. And uh, I have to confess that I was indeed very impressed you know, by the knowledge that was collected there and extraordinarily impressed you know, uh, uh, by the acuity of reason with which these writers rendered their various positions consistent. You know, uh, and then it struck me 
that from the point of view of a student, precisely that could be pretty disturbing because the positions were different positions. They were positions that contrasted with one another. Some saying this and some saying that. One could roughly align the positions on a kind of spectrum that we generally think of in terms of the difference between the political left and the political right. In other words, the frustrated student, instead of getting what he or she most desires you know, from a, a course in ethics, is simply given a reminder that we disagree about our values, we disagree about who we are, we disagree about where we should be headed, and we have no better way of responding to that than through politics. Now, that is to say, uh, through power. Now, let me try to uh, uh, ally with like-minded people so that I can push through this vision of where it is that humanity should be headed. Now, uh, that's uh, kind of a depressing thought. Now, on the other hand, I fully agreed with Ahmed now, uh, of the importance of somehow introducing an ethical dimension to education and doing so because of the urgency of the situation. We have amassed so much knowledge, and so much of that knowledge is dangerous knowledge. You know, we don't want to find ourselves you know, in the situation you know, of, uh, I don't know, a uh, chimpanzee maybe uh, uh, offered a, a loaded pistol yeah, you know, and the assurance that, uh, well, who knows, uh, maybe an aggressor might come and uh, he might need to defend himself with that. I mean, we don't, we don't want to have that loaded pistol in our hands. Uh, we particularly don't want to have that if we haven't done what we need to do, which is to reform our souls and to direct ourselves to a good that, alas, we cannot see clearly. So again, what we're doing involves something dangerous. The situation, though, is serious. We do need ethics, and presumably we need to teach ethics. Now, so this is my modest proposal that uh, instead of articulating possible values and then working with all of the acuity of our reason you know, on the project of making them clear you know, and then setting them one against the other, why don't we teach ethics from a deeper place? Well, it seems to be the predominant consensus among those who teach ethics that Socrates was right, that virtue and knowledge are one. That is to say, we would do what was right if we only understood clearly what is right. <coughs> right? If we only had that made fully clear to our understanding, then we would do what is right. Well, Socrates did articulate that as a kind of hope, well, but he added to it the moment of humility. But alas, he himself, after devoting his entire life you know, to the project of 
breaking through to a knowledge of the good, said, alas, all I know in this important regard is that I don't know. That constitutes, I think you all agree, a problem. Yeah. An easier way to see the severity of the problem is to be reminded of the fact that Socrates' favorite student, yeah, the one who most impressed him, yeah, the one where he could see the most hope, wasn't, as one would think, Plato, but instead Alcibiades. Yeah. He placed such hope in Alcibiades because Alcibiades was a young man of tremendous strength, tremendous courage, Tremendous intelligence, tremendous passion, someone who would have made a darn good philosopher. The problem, however, is that all of those qualities, down to and including intelligence and knowledge, all of those qualities, you know, are also useful for a tyrant. Now, Alcibiades became such a tyrant. Now, when Socrates said that he knew that he didn't know, surely in part he was saying that as much as he wanted to educate this young man, to the good, he wasn't able to do that. No. Now Aristotle, no. he responds to the Socratic dilemma by saying, you know, there are very deep reasons why it is that on the basis of your project, which is rendering consistent one position or another, there are very deeply seated reasons why that project could not have achieved the right education of Alcibiades. Aristotle's intuition is quite simply that we act in life rarely from our understanding. We act in life you know, from our impulses and from our heart. And the real problem of ethics, it would seem, is the problem of how to achieve a good heart. To clarify rational understanding isn't going to take care of a problem that is seated in the emotions and in the passions. I might know what the right thing to do is, but as Aristotle says, I have to honestly face the fact that human beings are tormented, for instance, by incontinence. It's hard for us to control our desires, to control our passions. We cannot simply, you know, by an act of intelligence, do that. Our lives are messy. Now, uh, an echo of St. Paul, now, uh, the uh, spirit is willing, but alas, 
the flesh is weak. So Aristotle's suggestion is that we need to take up the project that Plato had outlined in his famous Republic. The project of educating not simply minds, but educating desire itself. It's a project uh, that, as Plato set it forth, you know, uh, begins with gymnastics, you know, sports, <laughs> music, you know, dance. You know. And it included poetry and literature, but rather narrowly defined in the Platonic sense. You know, uh, there was something about poetry that frightened Plato. You know, there's something about poetry that frightened, frightened Plato for the, for the simple reason that it could unveil the tragic dimension of human existence. And of course, this is the real ethical problem, is it not? No, uh, not how do we distinguish between right and wrong, but how do we, knowing what is right, you know, responds to the fact that life puts before us again and again moral dilemmas. Now, uh, the problem is probably uh, uh, clearest for Immanuel Kant, you know, who took the Socratic ideal of consistency and elevated it to a principle of uh, clear and distinct reason, act in such a way you know, that the maxim that guides your action can be elevated to the status of a universal law. Act in such a way you know, that everyone should so act. You know, the problem, though, is that that yields with great clarity and understanding That's when you don't want to have this little microphone. <laughs> yeah. But you know, life being as it is, you know, the cough was a cough and uh, you know, we'll survive that. You know? um, what we have before us is um, a problem that needs some words. Kant uses his categorical imperative to make it clear, for instance, that one, <clears throat> one should never, ever lie. It violates the principle of reason itself. How could one tolerate a lie? He uses the same imperative to make it clear that one should always, always, always protect the lives of those around us. You know? So, what do we do you know, uh, when the drunken maniac comes waving his knife you know, and asks, where is John Monisakis? You know, and I, with perfect knowledge that he was here all day, you know, uh, but for whatever reason, you know, decided that my talk wasn't worth attending, you know, uh, that he is, and then I point, you know, the maniac with the knife, you know, towards where John Menisakis is, out of the spirit of what revenge? Yeah, uh, no, no, no. We have a problem, all right? We have two conflicting moral imperatives. 
And life presents us with such conflicts over and over and over. You know? It's not the case that we can resolve the ethical dilemma simply by virtue of an appeal to reason. Moreover, when you locate the heart of the ethical imperative in reason, then you're going to be drawn to that peculiar notion of Kant that a rational being has an ethical obligation simply to other rational beings. Wherever in the universe they might be, he adds, well, as if we don't have an obligation to our pets, to our farm animals, as if we don't have an ethical obligation to anything with heart enough to feel. No. Now, this one-sided attempt to address the ethical problem no, through the understanding is problematic, I would wager, on any number of fronts. You know, uh, the biggest problem, though, that I see in it is the one that I mentioned before, you know, which is the reality of human evil. And the fact that a simple declaration of the ethical is not going to itself make us better beings than we are. After all, an evil act is not an evil act if one initiates it in an innocent spirit. An evil act is an evil act to the degree that one knows that it's evil. Kant does help us, though, now, in one pretty important respect. Kant makes it clear, now, and here I would say he actually follows rather closely now, his philosophical opponent, Aristotle. Kant understands all of the desires, all of the physical things we need to do to stay alive, all of the useful things we need to do for ourselves. He understands all of those as good, for instance, doing what I need to do to preserve my life, as good only to the degree that it's in service of something higher. Now, now that leads for us to an astonishingly problematic observation. Because I started out this talk by referring to what I would regard as a kind of ignorant, arrogance you know, of the entire modern knowledge industry, insofar as that industry is based on utilitarian premises. And is not technology as a whole, in one word, the instrument instrumentalization of reason. The use of reason, that is to say, what is highest in us, you know, to serve what is lowest in us, our appetites. 
our comforts. And if Kant is right, then the very center of our collective consensus is already evil. I think there's a, a way that I could maybe illustrate this, um, thinking again of uh, my good dear friend Wendell Berry. <laughs> You know what? I'm going to add to Wendell Berry, Donald Trump. Okay, I mean, you know it's it's a, it's at least a gesture, you know, to 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 keep you listening to me, right? Okay, let me do it in this way. Wendell Berry sees himself as kind of a spokesperson, you know, for uh, what do they call them? The flyover states. Now, uh, places like where I grew up, now, uh, the agrarians, right? And uh, he basically sees that as the part of America that the wealthier part of America has colonized. So uh, what, 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 what takes place you know, in the flyover states? Well, industrial scale agriculture, which is disastrous for the land itself. The issue that really got Wendell Berry going was strip mining. Now, you can go into eastern Kentucky and see entire mountains have been taken apart. Now, and their rest and their remain dumped into rivers. No. And uh, the timber, of course. No. Uh, that is to say, the resources of uh, the flyover states no, have been uh, turned into money no, for the sake of uh, People who live in fancy suburbs in big cities. People who don't have to face the consequence of what they're doing. Okay. Make America great again. You know, wonder, you know, well, what could the appeal have been, you know, for uh, people like my extended family back in Kentucky. All of my cousins and uncles and brothers and sisters and so forth who did vote for Trump. The assumption would be, well, presumably they think that America was great in the guise of empire. You know, presumably they think that uh, America was great in the guise of white supremacy. No. Presumably, yeah, they simply have this romantic, nostalgic picture of a bygone America that has nothing to do with reality and is laced more with evil than with good. Yeah. I don't think so. <coughs> yeah. I remember when I was a kid and you could go and drink the water from any creek around. You know? I remember when you go through the woods you know, and people hadn't you know, torn it apart with their four-wheelers or whatever those vehicles are. You know? I remember you know, uh, a Kentucky that's no longer there. You can see evidence of it, though. And here, you know, I'll jump over from Donald Trump, who simply is making use of this, you know, back to Wendell Berry. 
Consider the shape of a town anywhere in America. Now, uh, you go into its center and you see buildings that used to uh, have shops selling this or that or that, right? And they were made with love. You can see it in the details of the building. Now, uh, you can see that they used real lumber. You can see that they used skilled laborers. You can see all of the ornate you know, features on the basic woodwork. And you know that these buildings were made by people who worked in the community, felt that they belonged to the community, and wanted to make their community beautiful. Now, uh, you can then go out farther to where people live, and you can see the care and attention people put into making their homes beautiful. And you go out a little bit farther, you know, and you get to the big box Walmart. That's the reason all of those beautiful buildings in the middle of town are boarded up. You know, because Walmart has found the formula for driving those people out of business. Now, now, the people who put the big box Walmart there, or Home Depot, or whatever it might be, you know, they live in one of those fancy suburbs outside of an East Coast city. They have no desire whatsoever you know, to make their buildings beautiful. Their only desire is to make them useful. To open up a zone that has no other real purpose but to channel money you know, from uh, the heartland you know, uh, into the pockets of the wealthy. And as a result, they have uglified America. It's not completely crazy <laughs> you know, to say, let's make America great again, if we understand that dimension, that aesthetic dimension. Now, here I'll get to my thesis, because David Schaefer didn't like anything that I just said, you know, but I'm going to add to it something that he'll like a whole lot. Yeah, and uh, and that is, while it's the case, he won't like this part, that the Republican Party <laughs> did a whole lot to make that savaging of America possible. Yeah, while that's the case, it's also the case that the Democratic Party had no interest whatsoever in keeping it from happening. Now, that's a problem. Now, that's a problem for us, you know, who would like to, uh, you know, maintain a kind of moral superiority by virtue of uh, our own recognition that after all ethics would have us love not only the members of our family, not only our friends, but ultimately ethics would have us love everyone on this earth. So knowing that, yeah, we can feel proud of ourselves yeah, for extending the ethical gesture into the international arena, and so forth and so on, and those rednecks in Kentucky can basically just go to hell. No. 
You know, the big problem you know, um, with ethics you know, lies in the complexity of the human soul. You know, uh, Socrates himself, you know, uh, when uh, in the Phaedrus, you know, he was trying to unveil the human soul you know, for the sake of his uh, beloved student. You know, uh, Socrates said, you know, looking into myself, I don't know what I really am, because sometimes I see a monster you know, as big as Typhon. And at other times, I see a sweet and gentle spirit. It's hard to know ourselves. It's hard to know ourselves for the simple reason that ourselves are as deep as reality itself. Uh, I don't know how long I've been talking or how long I'm allowed to talk. Uh, Teresa was supposed to tell no, me. You weren't really going to listen to me anyway, so I gave up. No, 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 no look, I'll, I'll do this and then disclose the fact that, you know, my, you know, I, I do the technology thing myself, you know, which is really embarrassing. And it's 4.15. I was about to disclose what it means to observe that uh, the human soul is as deep as reality itself. You know, I, I would gladly go on to do that, but, uh, you know, my time is, I guess, officially... No! no. No, 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 I have lots of time. Yeah, I go until 4.30, okay? That, by the way, that was artfully inserted as a bit of comic relief, okay? So, <laughs> back to my talk. <laughs> Here now is my thesis. So, Modernity is constituted by the ethical teleological horizon. And the ethical teleological horizon was opened up by bad theology. The bad theology made the assumption that God was the all-powerful spirit that controlled everything as if everything lay outside of him. Now, uh, there's some evidence here in terms of uh, uh, a certain Old Testament conception of the divine, of a divine, you know, so fully in control that if noting that people were not nearly the glorious creatures he wanted them to be, that he then, in a fit of divine grumpiness, would send a deluge and would wipe them off of the face of the earth, every man, woman, and child. You know, so a cantankerous God, a God sometimes good-mooded and sometimes angry and wrathful, but always a one God in control of everything. What does that miss? It misses the fact that this God, akin to the monster God Cronus, you know, of Greek mythology, the God so intent on control that he will devour all of his children out of fear that they might emerge as competitors. Now, 
that God, the God of nature, you know, uh, the nature that Hobbes unfolded as the warfare of all against all, that that God did not deserve the name God until a son emerged in whose face was such profound innocence and in whose words you know, were such eloquence and beauty that Father God Cronus found that his heart melted and he loved his son. The father needs the son to be a father. The son needs the father. Just as father and son are both needed by the spirit. Unless one thinks of the divine as community, one is going to appropriate the idea of the divine in precisely the way that modernity has done with its ethical teleological obsession. That is, with its forged in the Enlightenment conviction that given the fact that Descartes' cogito disclosed the ground of real certainty and the only real place of divinity there is, that given that, it was the rightful response of the entire modern ethic to say, we have waited for God to take care of our problems long enough. Now we are going to do what he should have done. And in doing that, you know, then placing itself in the position of what Kant called the transcendental ego. You know, understanding itself as the ground of all clarity and meaning in the world. You know, quite as if you know, uh, the human consciousness was a kind of disembodied spirit you know, guiding this great complex machine that was laid out as a machine on the basis of simple Newtonian principles of physics, and that the purpose of humanity was itself to save the world, and thus its ethical obligation. Thus the force and the confidence with which it found itself steering history in the direction of the globalized community of nations. Now, that, I would say, is itself <coughs> arrogant hubris. <coughs> and simply because we find ourselves to be citizens of the modern world does not mean that we have to go along with this vision that I warrant is a demonic one. And the mistake it makes is interesting. So, the stake, mistake it makes, you know, I refer to you know, when I evoked the picture of the disembodied intellect. You know, um, we, we, we can certainly get a sense for what that might feel like in the day of the smartphone, you know, uh, when it does look like carrying the world in our hand, you know, uh, life is to be experienced you know, somewhere outside of the world. Uh, 
right, as if we peer down on it, and with the help of all of the algorithms put at our disposal you know, by Silicon Valley, we manipulate it as we want to manipulate it. You know? That's a picture that I would warrant is itself monstrous. I know I'm not supposed to say what I'm about to say, but I think it's a fairly good example. You know? That is to say, you know, Yes, we live in an age where we have powerful uh, hormones put at our disposal by pharmaceutical companies and so forth and so on. Yeah. Yes, we live in an age yeah, uh, where something that is, I think, has always been very human. That is to say, every man among us has at least in times in their life, felt the presence of the woman inside them. And every woman among us has, at least in moments of their life, felt the presence of the man inside them. But now, we live in an age where adapting this notion of I myself am not my body, I myself am not what I was given by nature itself. And if I, as a male, want to let the woman inside me fully blossom, well, that's what I want. So I should be allowed to do that. Right? You know, that's, that's a highly problematic point of view. You know, uh, we are what we are by nature. And with the word nature, you know, I'm going to start to unravel the thought that I gestured towards when I said that in each of us is contained the full depth of reality itself. Um, yeah, nature. Nature, what from the point of view of the ethico-teleological principle is simply an object for us to manipulate, a set of resources for us to exploit, yeah, something that we can do something with, nature, is, in fact, at the bottom of who and what we are. There's a reason why the ethical cannot base itself simply on principles of the understanding. There's a reason why the ethical has to penetrate into the depth of the heart. You know? We are what we are from nature. The true transcendental is not Kant's transcendental ego. The true transcendental, ah, the true transcendental you know, is that miracle that lies embedded in the heart of Earth itself. You know, this, this, this condensation where the principle of contraction forced so much into the depths that as hot as the surface of the sun, you know, the center of the earth is molten metal. And finding a vent here or a vent there to release itself, it's brought into movement. And being brought into movement, it does what metal does when it spins. It magnetizes. And in magnetizing, the Earth itself distinguishes a North Pole from a South Pole. 
with two contrary magnetic attract attractions that ultimately want nothing more than to be together. And so the Earth itself, from within its deepest chamber, you know, has the structure of pushing those poles apart that would be together. The Earth itself is breathing. The Earth itself is alive. Before fully developing the Trinitarian conception that I alluded to in terms of the relationship between Father, Son, and Spirit, I would have to point out that those personalities emerge in response to the core of the real itself, which is Mother Earth. Older than the Father is, in fact, the Mother. Now, why might that be important? For first, first of all, let's just look at it from you know, the point of view of, 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 of natural science. Okay? Um, we have the vents opening up. We have the overheated magma elevating itself, pushing itself up, erupting into a volcanic action whereby the magnetic dynamo now gives way to chemical reactions in the depths of the ocean that gave birth to life itself. Life itself is the child of nature. Yeah. We cannot reverse this yeah, by developing, latching on to the Kantian fantasy yeah, that the transcendental ego is in full charge of everything. Yeah. Consciousness itself is ultimately a gift of nature herself. So deeply grounded is the self. Yeah. Now, this has some important consequences. For one thing, yeah, it reveals the depth of our kinship to all beings in the world. Our kinship to the plants, to the trees, to the birds, to all of the animals. Now, brother and sisters they are to us because they too were born from the same womb that gave us birth. Now, that has ethical consequences. But, Given the fact that that entire emergence was until the full emergence of the human understanding, that that entire emergence was a blind one, we can arrive quickly at an understanding of why it is that the problem of getting along with one another is not a problem that can simply be solved by establishing the ironclad rule of justice. Now, justice itself is something that we all want. Now, uh, and we will all, to the end of our days, complain of the fact that it can never be fully delivered. Now, justice itself as in the form of an obsession, in the form of a demand, has certainly led to as much pain in the form of punishment as criminality ever did deliver. So, justice itself is something that has to be tempered 
by mercy. Well, what is mercy? What is mercy? Now, when the life that emerges from the deep darkness of the inner belly of the earth herself, when that life emerges as the monstrous Kronos, now, intent upon devouring everything around it. When that occurs, we find ourselves in hell. There's a reason why the Divine Comedy is one of my favorite works of literature. Now, that hell is something that life broke out of in what we can at least understand with the metaphor of the Father, you know, who sees in his Son the face of innocence. To the point that something in the Father you know, is allowed to emerge to the fore, an innocence that the Father had long forgotten. A purity, if you will, that lies at the basis of the Father. Now, what we have, two different possibilities. You know, uh, one possibility you know, is uh, the, the Hobbesian. You know, uh, let us respond as well as we can with force you know, against the most the monstrous possibility of complete chaos. Now, uh, let us do this under the banner of justice. Let us place justice at the center of all of our concerns. Or we can refer instead to what has been unfolded out of the heart of the Father, the principle of love. Our obsession with justice has to give way to our recognition that what each one of us needs far above justice is mercy. Because each one of us carries within him or herself you know, problematic impulses and desires that we're never going to be full masters of. Okay? So with that idea, you know, with the idea that mercy should trump justice, with that idea that God, when he spoke to Job out of the whirlwind, you know, and said, who are you human beings so concerned with your little sufferings and your petty squabbles and so forth to demand justice from me. Open your eyes, look at the world, look at how beautiful it is. You know, look at the blue sky, the great white billowing clouds. Right? Uh, look at the stallion full of life charging down the hill. Look at this creation I have made. Can't you see? that that is enough. Why enough? Because it's beautiful. What's the good of beauty? The good of beauty is that beauty is what awakens in the beast goodness. Now, um, let me present that in a very concrete way. This is borrowed from Plato's Phaedrus, now, um, where uh, Socrates presents this very familiar to all of us image of the soul as being pulled by two different horses. Now, uh, one of them uh, unruly and horny as hell, and the other one uh, uh, mild and good. You know, pulling, uh, we, we find that the unruly horse, you know, uh, is hard to control. Now, here's the picture. Yeah. 
The young man sees the young woman and finds her fetching and desirable. We call that attraction. Okay? The young man, attracted to the young woman, moves towards her until he catches sight of her beauty. Catching sight of her beauty he steps back in awe and in wonder. He doesn't step back because someone <laughs> told him the rule around here is that you can look but don't touch, right? That's, that's, that's not what is going on here. He steps back when he is open to her humanity and her beauty. It is beauty itself that civilizes us. It is beauty itself that has freed us, emancipated us from that horrific Hobbesian nature of the warfare of all against all. Yeah. So what I would like to suggest in terms of very practical, but how do you teach ethics? You know? Teach ethics by teaching literature. You know? There's certainly good things that professional ethicists do. I'm not going to say anything against their hard work. And for one thing, they do help you see how it is that you develop ethical reasoning and so forth and so on. I'm not putting that into question, but I will say, if your purpose you know, is the education of the human soul, then please teach ethics by teaching literature. What is the advantage of a good story? The advantage of a good story, you know, is that I read in the words written by someone else something that speaks to me so profoundly that everything in me wishes that I were capable of writing something just like that. You know, literature is what has the power of making us friends with one another. You know, uh, it's deplorable that we divide ourselves into liberal and conservative camps. You know, uh, there is a reason for being conservative, because there's much worth conserving. There is reason for being liberal, because there's much that needs change. Just as the physical body can go on only if we breathe in and hold it in and then breathe out. Any good conservative knows that one of the things we need to conserve is the liberal impulse of Western civilization. Any good liberal in making the gesture of tolerance and so forth and so on, should recognize in the conservative a person who is speaking from a reasonable point of view that absolutely has to be heard. Yeah. And uh, with that, because I think I've talked long enough, I'll just shut up. David. Yes, I mean, so far as I know, the only person named in your lecture, other than somebody who knows me, whose whereabouts he worked on a report. To the There's John Monasakis. He, 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 he just didn't want to come to my lecture, that's all. Okay. Yeah. Okay. No, no. I, I know you were joking, but I'm sure that many members of your audience didn't when you spoke of uh, my being ultimately pleased or 
<laughs> right. Uh huh. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. That that That's right. That's right. <laughs> no, 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 no. I used to be able to do this kind of thing really well, but I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm old. I, you know, I've, I've, I've lost it. I, you know, I just kind of, you know, uh, you know. I mean, I'm, I'm over the hill. It's time for Teresa Fenichel. She, 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 she can do absolutely everything that I can do, except a whole lot better because she can do it conversationally. No. Yeah? Right. Um, and if I understood that correctly, although you explicitly spoke of photos, the implication seemed to me uh, to be that the God of the Hebrew Bible. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you know, I. I uh, a son named Christ. Right. Did I misunderstand you? Yeah. Yeah. No, actually, you did misunderstand me because things like this need a whole lot more words. Okay, and uh, 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 do I find God with Cronus features in the Hebrew Bible? I certainly find that. I mean, you know, that deluge thing was awfully mean and nasty. But as I read the Hebrew Bible, you know, uh, that God sheds more and more of his wrath. That God, by the time of Isaiah, that God is precisely the God that I'm talking about, right? And just how and by what, you know, uh, uh, inner, you know, mechanism of divinity, uh, uh, you know, that transformation took place, uh, I'm not going to venture to say, but I will say uh, that, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the Hebrew God, you know, uh, uh, as depicted, well, uh, has his good moments and his bad moments, as does the New Testament God, as depicted, have his good moments and bad moments. Uh, scriptures are anthologies. You know, and uh, anthologies are wonderful because uh, uh, they reflect uh, uh, the complexity of the human understanding. You know? And that is certainly my most emphatic point. That's why I say, please teach ethics through literature, because literature is able to stay true to the profound ambiguities that run through life, right? Uh, there's, um, in, in, when I picked up the arm full of books on you know, ethics, um, one of them was by a really famous ethicist who's uh, He's a utilitarian and he's a vegetarian and, and I, I Peter, Singer? Peter Singer, yeah. Peter Singer. And 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 uh, it had it was it was it was 
from a bunch of stories. I was thinking, my gosh, Peter, this is great. You know, it's literature. Teach ethics through literature. But then the title of it was The Moral of the Story. <laughs> no, no, no. When I say teach ethics through literature, I'm not talking about distilling it into a one-dimensional moral. I'm talking about something else. I'm talking about that which can enable me you know, uh, in all of the layers of myself down to that deeply hidden, concealed part of myself that is the really lonely part of myself, that I can recognize that that's not just me, that's all of us. It's who we are, right? And in recognizing that, I feel, uh, you know, our sense of obligation to one another. Um, anyone else? Yeah? I'm wondering um, if you could talk about the connection between uh, teaching ethics and being an ethical teacher. I think as a teacher, there's a lot of discussion about what it is to, to be ethical in your profession. And I particularly want to hear you talk about that. Right. I mean, that's, that's a hard one. I mean, because uh, uh, what I'm claiming is that there's something faintly unethical about <coughs> the idea of teaching ethics from the standpoint of expertise. Right? Uh, so that would seem to place a tremendous burden on anyone who's teaching ethics. Uh, the burden of acknowledging their own humanity, you know, and the burden of acknowledging that their desire for the good is such a strong and vibrant desire precisely because they themselves are embedded in such problematic impulses and, you know, and have done things that are wrong, right? That is to say, uh, uh, the, you know, my, 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 my real objection, you know, to teaching ethics only from treatises that try to work out coherent ideas about what the ethical is, is that if you just stop there, all you've delivered is a formula for self-righteousness, right? And, I mean, and we know how problematic that is. I mean, we know, getting back to, you know, uh, my redneck cousins and so forth and so on, uh, uh, just how severe the problem of backlash can be uh, when uh, out of colleges like this, out of universities, you have people saying, uh, you know, well, we have figured everything out and this is the way you're supposed to live your life and this is the language you can use and so forth and so on. I mean, the regime of political correctness you know, is uh, uh, not only doomed to failure because you can't simply create good people by telling people what to do, it's not only doomed to failure, but it's also can only awaken a strong negative reaction. You know, it's like, you know, who in the hell do you goody-goody liberals, you know, think you are? You know, that, did you, do you really think that I don't love my children? Do you really think that I don't care about my neighbors? Yeah. Do you really think that, you know, I can't be a good person until I tether myself to, uh, you know, this, 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 this shared project, you know? No, no. Uh, and, and, and I would add, by the way, uh, with regard to the regime of political correctness, um, that uh, uh, one of the things that irks me is that people forget that it was the Republicans who invented such a regime, uh, you know, with their everyone has to be on board with, uh, uh, you know, no taxes and so forth and so on. But that's the political part of me coming out. That's not the real part, you know, that the real part of me is kind and gentle because I'm now 60 some years old and, you know, and my hair is starting to turn gray and, you know, I'm getting <laughs> feeble and, you know, no, it is. I mean, at least here in the beard. Yeah. Yeah. Um, anyone else? Yeah.
many of the things that you ended up yeah. advocating for, the friendship, um, the, you know, reconsideration of, I guess, uh, the hubris of Kant and Hobbes or something. I feel like that's in yeah, yeah. What that led me to ask is, are you giving modernity a bad rap? Are, are a lot of the things that you're cautioning against from a kind of like Heideggerian critique of technology, aren't all of those things a lot older, pre-Greek in a way, going back to the early theocracies, early civilizations that we haven't got rid of, but that perhaps the radical modernity of Spinoza, you know, is, it has been leading us to question. And, and that goes through Socrates and right. That's right. That's right. I mean, I, I, I uh, 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 you know, openly say guilty as accused. That was an oversimplification for the sake of a lecture. But it was also meant, my gosh, I'm on the verge of retirement, you know. So it's like my one opportunity to give a sermon, you know. <laughs> you know? And, you know, if you're going to give a sermon, you know, then, then, then you know, you, you, you do this kind of thing. Uh, but yes, emphatically. It's always more complicated than that. Uh, Spinoza, by the way, was strongly in, present in my talk in the guise of all of the shelling that was there, and in guise, you know, above all of the uh, the, the root idea, uh, which is uh, uh, Deus sive natura. Yeah. You know, it's the same problem, and it's the same problem for the same reason. And uh, uh, you know, since 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 I you know was so bold as to say how ethics should be taught, you know, let me very quickly just reorganize the entire university, okay? <laughs> and that is to say, you know, we have to break through this obsession with research, which carries with it the implication that knowledge in its every form is always something inherently good, over against the regime, the research agenda, I would like to rehabilitate the idea of thinking. Now, what's the difference between research and thinking? Now, thinking knows that it doesn't know. Yeah. Thinking is urgent yeah, because of the need to gain a clarification that it doesn't have. Yeah. The research agenda is just pulling together all the possible answers you can, you know, in the hope that when people have them all, they will use them to good purpose. Well, sometimes they do use them to good purpose, and sometimes they use them to very bad purpose. Yeah. And our situation... <laughs> Um, <laughs> Cormac McCarthy you know, uh, wrote a book called The Road. It's the most optimistic book I think I've ever read. You know? Why? Because it presents the utter hopelessness of uh, the world post-nuclear apocalypse. It presents in its horror human beings hungry and therefore cannibalistic and so forth and so on. But it does it in the guise of a father taking his little boy to what he hopes somehow or another might be safety, telling the boy stories that clearly the father himself doesn't really believe you know, because the father himself is a paranoid maniac yeah, but in the stories, right, he always presents the idea that we should be kind to one another. And the little boy yeah, outlives the father, and the little boy is a good little boy, and he's the hope of humanity. And in introducing the book, I think it was on page three, yeah, um, McCormick, 
Was that his name? I forget who I'm talking Carmack about. McCarthy. Yeah, uh, Carm <laughs> Carmack McCarthy. Yeah, Carmack McCarthy. Yeah. Uh, my memory is just, you know, completely <laughs> shot. <laughs> but anyway, it was on page three. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he says, you know, and if that boy is not the word of God, then I know not what the word of God could be. And for me, that, it's like, okay, we do the global warming thing, the seas rise, you know, the people, they, 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 the resource warfare and so forth and so on. Humanity just goes off the cliff and, and, and the world population goes down from, you know, it's seven billion to, you know, a billion brave survivors, you know, whatever that horrific thing is, it's not the end of the world. Well, and it can never be the end of the world. Well, and there can be no end of the world. Because as I said, the earth itself is alive. And if she's destroyed, there's plenty more of them up there. Well, reality is something that is only given within experience itself. People make mistakes when materialists abstract the material universe out of experience and saying that's what's really real, or your theological types abstract consciousness and spirit out of the world and say that's what it really is real. No, what's really real is this lived experience. And it's not just real for us, it's real for reality as a whole. And understanding that is to understand that it's meaningful to talk about eternal life. So, any other questions? Yeah. So as you mentioned, uh, one of the best ways to teach the ethics is through the literature. Yeah. But for the past century, we have postmodern art, we have Derrida, we have James Joyce. We all have different kind of way to interpret things. And how do we define which is, uh, like, as you said, like based on the reality? But still, like, is that kind of too empiricalism or like too practical? Or do, uh, do we still need a censorship like what Plato did? No, we don't need the censorship. But I think you do rightfully point to the fact that uh, knowledge is ever so diverse and comes in so very, very many layers. But I'm glad you mentioned the name James Joyce. Yeah. It opens up with Stephen Daedalus declaring you know, uh, that history is uh, the hell you know, uh, from which I want to escape, right? And that serves as the explanation for why Homer has to be Mr. Bloom's partner throughout that day. History is something that we moderns would like to say is a thing of the past because we figured out how to fix the world and give it lots of shopping malls and so forth and so on. And we can declare this you know, era of neoliberal rationality as being uh, the end of history. We always want an end of history. We always want an end of history because it causes so much pain when we're always fighting against one another, but one who thinks that is going to think you only read literature in order to disclose its errors. What Stephen Daedalus realizes is that because that's an illusion and we're always in history, and that is to say, following up on what you were saying, you know, always in confusion, always having competing claims and so forth and so on. Because of that, we always need to maintain contact uh, with uh, uh, the best spirits that have ever lived through history, right? Uh, I, you know, I, just a thought that, you know, came down on me, so I'm going to say it, yeah? 
Um, the great crime in Sophocles' Oedipus the King you know, is uh, uh, murdering the father and uh, uh, sexually inhabiting the mother, you know? ravaging the mother, if you will. You know? Well, basically what I want to say is we have to realize that we seem to be intent in this epoch of our <laughs> history, we seem to be intent on, murder, on murdering father tradition as we ravish Mother Earth. Yeah. And to the degree that that's true, yeah, we've got to be careful. Yeah. And that's the gesture that I opened up my talk with. All right, is uh, we have to wean ourselves away from uh, our reckless, arrogant ignorance. Yeah. And we have to proceed in all humility. And I apologize for the fact that when one challenges an established order by saying it's too damned arrogant, one cannot help but to sound awfully arrogant doing so. Yeah. Story of my life. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, well, class dismissed. <laughs> <laughs>